Meow, I'm Hoople's cat. Please do not self-medicate. I'm an RN, not a doctor. This video is what I would use to treat radiation sickness in a full nuclear war. None of this information is safe for you. So World War Three has started and nuclear bombs have dropped. Or yet another nuclear power plant has suffered a meltdown. Or a dirty bomb has been detonated in a major city close to you. This video will focus on how I would treat radiation sickness in the event of a full nuclear war, in the complete absence of any formalised healthcare setting. If you can, use formal healthcare, not self-medication, for everything. Okay, what are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to open my over-the-counter kit full of stuff that I'm going to take if I have radiation sickness to try and give me a chance of survival. Many people seem to believe that activated charcoal is the thing to take for radiation sickness and I'd like to assure you they're completely wrong. In formal healthcare settings in 2023 we generally protect the airway of any patient that's going to receive activated charcoal and we do this using plastic tubes. The reason being it induces incredible vomiting and they're already usually drowsy because of sickness or because of medication abuse. Thus the vomit in their mouth goes into their lungs. If there's radioactive material in the stomach, it's going to get in the lungs. And honestly, alpha and beta radiation in the lungs is a far, far bigger problem than in the gut. On top of that, activated charcoal pretty much fails to stop the absorption of radioactive material from the gut into the bloodstream. It doesn't block it in any way at all. It also causes a lot of constipation, further keeping the radioactive material in the bowels and gut for much longer than you otherwise would be. It also causes constipation, which keeps the radioactive material in the body for longer than otherwise. All of these things are a bad thing. However, like most things, advocates still push it as a treatment for radiation sickness. They don't understand correlation versus causation. If it worked for this, healthcare would use it. We don't. This is my fourth video on this topic and you really should watch the other three. This video is only going to focus on what over-the-counter medications I would take and the doses and when I would take them and for how long I would take them. Oh, and you really should have a Geiger counter. Potassium iodide, potassium iodate is an absolute must-have thing that you can't really buy over-the-counter but you can still get it, it's still available though the price seems to be getting higher and higher. But I've well covered potassium iodide before and I'm not doing it again in any detail in this video. I'm not recommending the site, I'm just using the images from it. The truth is potassium iodide or potassium iodate is an absolute must-have prep before the bombs drop or before the nuclear plant melts down. You really have to have it. Doesn't matter what your age group is, but the younger the people you're looking after, the more critical it's going to be to give it to them. It's not going to be very widely available if we have a nuclear war. But what else do we have to worry about? Cesium-137 is one of them. By the way, cesium-134 is also liberated. We don't really know too much about it, so we just pretend it's cesium-137. Both of these radioactive materials are liberated in large amounts if there's nuclear plant meltdown or if a nuclear bomb explodes. After either of those occurrences, it's going to be in the air, it's going to be in what you eat, and it's going to be in what you drink. Oh yeah, and because of the half-life, it's going to be a problem, a direct problem to survival, for over 300 years. I'm using this site and others to offer evidence-based and obtainable measures in case there is no formal healthcare available after a large nuclear war. Modern medicine will use Prussian blue, which is not, very much not, the paint. Don't eat Prussian blue paint, dye, or anything else labelled Prussian blue unless it's Prussian blue medication. To say it's hard to get is a bit of an understatement these days, and I wish I'd got it when I could have got it. If you do have it, you're going to need to take 3 grams a day for at least 30 days. The only unavailable bottle I found is a 25 gram bottle. Now if you do have Prussian blue medication available, please bear in mind that when you take it, it's going to flush potassium, which is an element out of your body like nothing else. You will rapidly get into heart problems. You need to take a potassium supplement. The potassium supplement you need to take is not the potassium iodate. You'll have to take potassium as a tablet and you'll have to buy that. Oh, and if you take too much potassium, you'll also kill yourself. Potassium is a tricky one. So to get cesium-137 out of your body, you're going to have to drink about 4 litres of non-contaminated water a day and possibly use pectin. There's nothing else particularly available other than Prussian blue that we can find that you'd be able to use. Now, all fruit pectins work for this. Apple has the most pectin in it. That's why people push apple juice. I'm going to use the capsules over the powder for convenience. Pectin powder, pectin tablets. 
this is kind of arguable. There's a whole bunch of research on this done from one guy once in uh, the post Chernobyl area of Ukraine and Belarus. And it probably works, it does bind and it will help you out. So you should have this and it's pretty easy to get, pretty cheap to get and pretty safe to use. So I would suggest you use pectin and a little bread. So what happens after that fact? Or for people who have gotten caught outside, what happens for them? For them, apple juice. Why apple juice? That seems like a relatively uh, uh, non-consequential item to have for a nuclear disaster. During the Chernobyl incident, in which there was uh, cesium-137, was uh, some children were inundated with it. 17 years after the Chernobyl incident, uh, the nuclear power accident that happened at Chernobyl, most of the radio contaminated among the populace were children. Uh, the varying levels of 137C, so cesium-137, absorbed among children in this area was explained by their food source. So they were continuing to eat things that had radiation in them, especially milk. Milk is a big, uh, you know, the animals pick up the radiation or they have it inside them, it transfers to the milk glands and they're given to children, human children. So what did they do? They gave them apple juice, just apple juice. The pectin inside of apple juice binds to cesium-137 pulls it into your intestines and lets you pass it through your urine. Apple juice can save your life. Why should you have it? Because you need it. You have to have a solution. What happens when you run out of potassium iodide pills? What happens if you're already exposed or your family is? So to further block the absorption of cesium-137 from the bowels and stomach into the bloodstream, you can try using bentonite clay. If you're gonna use it, use it with lots of vegan chocolate, lots of water, and a massive amount of metamucil. Bentonite clay, half to one tablespoon a day forever. That's what the hippies use. But for me, and it's hard to find it, what I would recommend you take in a nuclear emergency if you're trying to decontaminate yourself because you've actually already ingested heavy metals and radioactive material, is one to two tablespoons a day for seven days. Now I'd recommend, because I think it's a great idea, uh, mixing it in vegan chocolate. And apparently they tried this with cows and they dropped the radiation in the milk by 50%. Now I don't know why they're giving vegan chocolate to cows and I can't find the study, so I just have to take my word on it. I think this won't harm you too much, except it will give you massive and severe constipation. So make sure you have a ton of metamucil, and I'm not kidding. If you're going to drink this without vegan chocolate, what you want to do is mix it in about eight ounces of water and then repeat another eight ounces and preferably another eight ounces after that. You're going to get really constipated if you start using this, but it might work. And Metamucil actually will work with some of these medications to actually increase the removal of radioactive isotopes from within the body. What about radium-226? Now radium-226 for our purposes is effectively about the same as strontium-90. Strontium-90 is also a massive threat to you in a nuclear war. The other thing I wanted to get and I haven't got in this box is calcium phosphate powder. If you have calcium phosphate powder that's safe for humans to eat, you want to take 1.2 grams of it or 1,200 milligrams of it once a day. It will help you excrete radioactive radium isotopes and strontium isotopes from throughout your body. Now most cesium-137 and strontium-90 will be normally excreted out of your body after ingestion. Some of it won't. So the more you can block it getting into your body via the gut, the better off you're going to be. So we have blocking agents. We don't have anything to force it out of your body. The truth is pectin studies are very, very few, but pectin does actually increase the excretion of strontium-90 and cesium-137 out of the body. But you're gonna have to empty your bowels, don't get constipated. Now how long's radium-226 gonna be a threat for? Well, around about 20,000 years. But the good news, you can cheaply reduce the amount of it in your body. Calcium phosphate's the go-to here if it's available to you. It's hard to get. But calcium carbonate is very cheap, widely available, and very easy to get. It will compete with the radium-226 and strontium-90 to bind in the bone. And that's where you don't want the strontium and the radium to end up. So blocking it by adding extra calcium is a great idea. However, as I've said, it's a blocking agent. It's not going to actively remove it if it's already there. After a large-scale nuclear war, I'd suggest taking calcium carbonate each day for the rest of your life, provided it's safe for you to take it. This is particularly true for children who are growing bones and any adult with a bone break because when the bones reheal, they're going to suck in strontium and radium into the bone material and if you can replace it with calcium, that's what you want to do. I get this for sure, calcium carbonate. 
Um, you want to take approximately one to two grams a day for about 30 days. Continue onwards if you still have radiation poison symptoms that are severe and this will reduce radium and it will reduce sontium. If you have a hard time getting this, and remember I got this from Costco cheap, it also has vitamin D which is a really useful thing to have in a nuclear situation. Try looking for Tums. Always read the labels. This is actually calcium carbonate and each tablet is a gram. So what I'm looking for here is two of these a day for 30 days. Now I have enough of this to do that easily. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to remember this or not but aluminium hydroxide was very much linked with Alzheimer's disease and they mostly removed it from pretty much all of the products it had been in. Aluminium hydroxide, nothing else, just aluminium hydroxide is a great blocker of absorption of radioactive material from your gut. Sodium alginate is going to do the same thing but at the doses you need to take the Gaviscon with you're actually going to get half the recommended dose of sodium alginate for free. It's funny how uranium-235 is barely mentioned in any videos these days, but it actually will be liberating quite large amounts by nuclear war. I'd consider taking water tablets, diuretics, but I'm a trained nurse. I know I can get them and I know I can give them safely. You may not be in that position. Especially with radiation sickness, the fluid loss can easily kill, as can the electrolyte loss. Very dangerous thing to use, but you can use... Baking soda! Humble baking soda! You know, eat this, make absolutely sure you get pure baking soda. If it says natural or whatever, who cares? You want to look at the, re the ingredients list? It has to have zero additives, so you could really harm yourself here. You want to take one tablespoon of this a day for seven days. It decreases the uranium isotopes in the human body. It does it by helping them excrete by the bladder in your urine. This means that your urine is going to be very, very radioactive, so bear that in mind. This stuff is recommended IV. Most people won't be able to give this IV. And I can tell you right now, as a retired critical care nurse, giving intravenous sodium bicarb or sodium bicarb to anybody is really 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 dangerous and it's not something I recommend you do it unless you have a full and functional ICU at your capacity and you can take blood gases very frequently. You won't have the ability to do that even if you are Elon Musk in a nuclear war. To get rid of tritium all you have to do is drink about four litres of non-radioactive water a day and it should pass through you quite fast. Now modern healthcare uses calcium gluconate intravenously for strontium-90 toxicity. It's hard to get without a prescription and I'd also suggest giving IV medications is probably not going to work for most people. Now calcium gluconate as a tablet is actually very simple and cheap to get. I would use it for about six days at the normal dosage recommended. Now I've not mentioned side effects contraindications on who should not take these medications because none of those apply to me. This video is about my meds or what I would take in a full on nuclear war. Not about you, you are not me. As much as you might wish to be. The REMM site is absolutely wonderful for all of this information. You absolutely need to go to that site, you need to print out stuff from that site. There's not a lot of it but it's brilliantly done and you can just click links and you can find out a whole bunch of things. For example, calcium gluconate should never be taken if you've got a heart that's slow, bradycardia. So if you're going to take it, then if you're smart, you would actually take your pulse daily and stop taking it if the pulse drops below 60 for an adult. Unless you're very, very fit, in which case your heart rate's going to be lower normally. It's important to know your own physiology. Now if you're on digoxin or quinidine medications, absolutely never take calcium gluconate tablets. Never. So for acute radiation sickness, modern medicine is going to go to these five medications. I have two of them. I'd love deferoxamine, not happening, can't get it, and EDTA, again, I can't really get it in the doses I need. But for cesium-137, and I'd really love to be able to get medical Prussian blood. I'm dealing with what I can get, not what I want to get or what I need to get. You can only use what you can get. So this is my list of medications I would take if I had radiation sickness or if a member of my family had radiation sickness and I couldn't get formal health care. In a post-nuclear attack world, you probably need to repeat this treatment on a frequent basis because you're going to get radiation sickness on a repeated basis. This is some pictures of my nuclear war preps. They're all useful for other things as well. To conclude, getting repeated bouts of radiation sickness is a really bad idea. Each time you get it increases the chance that this time you're going to get a fast-acting cancer or a leukemia that will kill you. LD50-30 means that 50% of the exposed populations are going to be dead 30 days after the exposure. 
LD100-30 means 100% of the exposed population will be dead 30 days after the exposure. The fact that we routinely use LD50-30 when looking at response to radiation events should tell you something about how serious you should take this. In 2023, medical care for high-dose radiation sickness doesn't do much at all. People still die. They just die a bit longer and in a bit more pain. If the background radiation is only 10 rads an hour, which is a colossally high dose, by the way, expect to get GI syndrome about 100 hours after exposure. So if you're not in a shelter or you haven't been evacuated, after four days outside, you're going to get GI syndrome from even small nuclear bombs if you're too close to the epicenter. For this reason, you're going to try and stay inside a shelter as long as possible for the rest of your life. You're also going to try and avoid contaminated food and drink and wood burning for as long as you possibly can. The risk of inhaling radioactive material rapidly causes lung cancer. You're going to be wearing an N95 mask and you're going to have to reuse a lot of the gear that you're going to use. You can't just use it once and throw it in a bin. Walmart shut. Now as a nurse, I haven't mentioned nursing care. Nursing care is a critical component to looking after anybody who's sick without modern healthcare and specifically important for radiation sickness. Turning frequently, mouth care, avoiding infections, encouraging fluids, a whole bunch of issues that go in nursing care. You're not going to go far wrong getting a 1960s or a 1970s basic nursing text and looking at that. Many modern nurses won't have a clue what to do without computers, without IVs and without all the gizmos of modern technology. But I would also recommend, if you're able to get hold of it, broad spectrum antibiotics. For people with radiation sickness, they're going to be immunosuppressed. Three to six months after the fall of society, if society falls, penicillin should work as well as it used to work. Gefexalin, good for chests. Doxycycline, good for a whole range of things. Doesn't last that long, but it's a good one. Most of them last for about 10 to 15 years. Clindamycin, amoxicillin, a very good go-to one. Everybody should have amoxicillin and flucloxacillin. Ciprofloxacin, excellent. There are a whole bunch of different things. Studies have shown that good nursing care and antibiotics broad spectrum used early and effectively actually tended to half the number of people that died at day 30 after exposure. That's a pretty significant gain. Now this is a small sample size and people that work in the nuclear power plant industry tend to be highly educated and very well paid. Being higher educated and having more money tends to mean that you're going to live a longer life than average. They probably all stopped smoking as well once they had high dose of radiation. It really frightens you when that happens to you. So remember, radiation is an invisible killer. Plan on dealing with it if you have to. Plan on dealing with it for years. Don't stop wearing a mask because nobody in your area is wearing one after a month because they're uncomfortable. Not a good idea. If you don't think nuclear bombs are ever going to be used in wartime, that's a form of denial. Good luck with that. If you also think there's no way it's going to affect you where you live, good luck with that. Large-scale nuclear war will change life on Earth forever. It may well not be survivable, but we're going to try. So as ever, feel free to clip and copy any part of this video, but please do give me some credit for it when you use it. I do like that. It's kind of polite to do that. Thanks for watching. Ask me any questions you want in the comments below. Do encourage you to look at those links, especially the REMM site. You really need to be on that if you're going to do any of these preps. Good luck in the apocalypse. Doodles. Oh, and next Friday, I'm going to do sprains. This has been a 2023 Tiny Terry Refusing to Get Out of Bed production. You still here? It's time to go. It's over. Go.